for Israel, Gilgal became a significant location, but it's not something that we know exactly where it is. We know that it was northeast of Jericho somewhere, probably three to five miles. There was another Gilgal that was especially associated with Elijah and Elisha that probably was not this same location. It was probably up in the hill country. Among the things that they remember from this location is there was the original landing point. When they crossed the Jordan River, which sits about two or three miles to our east, this was where they camped for a long time. The word Gilgal literally means a circle of stones, and a lot of times those were used in religious practices. And some people speculate, since it was a place of circular stones, some place that was more of a sacrificial site, it makes sense that we might not have as much to find. To imagine Moses being on the other side on Mount Nebo looking in, and to imagine all of those Israelites crossing the Jordan across a dry riverbed and setting up memorial stones that came from the bottom of the riverbed, you understand what a historical national monument just the spot would have been. And so it makes sense that the place of primary sacrifice for their first king was at that spot. Samuel would rotate between Ramah and Mizpah and Bethel and Gilgal as he did his yearly duties. Saul was told by Samuel that there was going to come a time in which he was going to need to meet him here and to wait on him so that Samuel could offer sacrifice. Saul waited and waited and waited, and when Samuel didn't come quick enough for Saul, he went ahead and offered a sacrifice. At that sacrifice, Samuel proclaimed something very strong against Saul. Samuel actually told Saul that he was going to take the kingdom away from his family and he was going to look for a man after God's own heart. I think there are personal lessons that we can all learn from Saul and the mistakes that he made. Where we get ahead of God, whether out of fear or desperation, we don't wait. And so we act out on our own and try to solve our problems in ways other than what God has instructed. Later in Saul's life, Samuel had given him the instruction to utterly destroy the Amalekites. When Samuel arrived here at Gilgal, Saul had saved King Agag and a number of the best cattle. This did not sit well with Samuel. Well, he had disobeyed God's instruction and he'd failed to finish the battle. And Samuel actually picks up a sword and he's the one who kills King Agag at Gilgal on the spot. And it was at this point when Samuel and Saul parted ways. It mentions in the Bible that, that Samuel never saw Saul again. And it was a dramatic parting. I mean, when Samuel explained to him that the kingdom had been removed from him and that God was gonna be looking for somebody else, Saul clung to him, tore his robe, Samuel used it as an object lesson. Just like you've torn my robe, God's torn the kingdom away from you. I think it's fitting when we're talking about Saul to come to a place like Gilgal where we're not exactly sure where it is because there were some things that he did for the kingdom that were positive. He was the first national ruler. He was the first one to try to take the military out and to transition from the judges to a king. But in a lot of ways, his kingship was temporary. And so just like Gilgal, we're not exactly sure where that was. That's kind of Saul. My personal opinion is that the text indicates he was always ill-suited to be a ruler. And it seems to hint that God gave them the ruler they deserved. They had rejected him and God was going to give them a leader that was suited to helping them learn that they needed to rely on him. Things really didn't start to progress until you get to David. After God rejected Saul at Gilgal, God sent Samuel to anoint somebody else, a man after his own heart, and he sent him to the home of Jesse the Bethmelite, so someone that lived in Bethlehem. Samuel was afraid that Saul would hunt him down when he found out that he was going to anoint another king. God actually gave Samuel a cover story of going down and offering a sacrifice with this family. They went through seven of Jesse's sons, didn't find the right one, and Jesse ends up explaining that he's got one more son who's out in the field taking care of the sheep. And that's exactly where they found David. David would have been out in an area just like this. I'm seeing these little paths cutting through the field. What are those? Well, those are actually paths caused by the sheep as they walk through here. Shepherds still bring their sheep to these hillsides even today. This is not what I would have pictured a field to look like. We often have the idea of 
pasture land and where you would take sheep to graze as being nice and lush and green. But we're in the hill country of Judah and this is the area where people would have been. I don't think it's an overstatement to talk about how formative David's time was as a shepherd as a young man. You know, he references uh, the lessons he learned taking care of his sheep and defending them when he's explaining to Saul, look, God took care of me fighting off a lion and a bear. He's gonna take care of me as I go out and fight this Philistine. He refers to David as the shepherd of Israel, how he took him from shepherding sheep to shepherd his people. And it's interesting too that once you get to the New Testament that Jesus pulls that imagery to talk about himself. And he says, I am the good shepherd. Of course, a good shepherd, just like David would have been, would know how to take care of his sheep and know how to provide for them and protect them. We've seen them responding to their shepherd's call. You know, he'll whistle, he'll click, he'll have an instruction, and they turn and they pay attention. Taking care of animals is not always a glamorous job. You know, it's smelly, it can get dirty, you're out in the open. It was that kind of responsibility that God used to get David ready for leading the kingdom. The occupation of a shepherd hasn't changed from David's time to now. Same country, same hillside, same type of pastures, same trails. The Bible knows what it's talking about. As it describes this millennia old occupation that was so formative, it just really helped to visualize that. It makes it come alive. After Saul was rejected by God and Samuel, you try to imagine how much turmoil he must have felt trying to figure out when his time as king of Israel would be over. Samuel, in secret, anoints David, but he hasn't been installed as a king yet. Saul is trying to fight these battles with the Philistines, wondering when he's going to be replaced. And that brings us to one of the most famous stories in all of the Old Testament as we walk beside a brook in the Valley of Elah. If I were to ask someone, tell me the story of David and Goliath. They would tell me that there was this giant, and he came and fought against the Israelites, and it was a wonderful opportunity to show the faith of David. And they would be exactly right. That's the right story. But the Bible tells it a little bit differently. The Bible scopes it in geography. In 1 Samuel 17, it starts off and says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and so they were gathered at Socah, which belongs to Judah. And Socah is located just along that ridge over there on the East. eastern end of the valley. Mm -hmm and they encamp between Soka and Azekah. Now Azekah sits just around the corner here. So we are in between Soka and Azekah. Said Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up a line of battle against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, that mountain over there, mm -hmm. and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. And that's how the Bible sets up this story. Then it introduces the main characters of the story. Well, then later on we know that when David finally went down to battle with Goliath, he didn't use any of Saul's armor or his sword, but he crosses a brook and picks up five smooth stones. Right, and of course we just crossed the brook ourselves right here below us. So he would have come down from the Israelite camp, crossed that brook, and then gone down into the valley. That's exactly right. Then David came out here and faced the giant. And I believe at that point he gives one of the most moving speeches that's in all of the Bible. In 1 Samuel 17, after Goliath has taunted him, it says in verse 45, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name... I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the beast of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 
that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. Such a beautiful speech. And of course, we know that as soon as he finished that, he took one of those stones, put it in his sling and killed Goliath. It's obvious reading that and sharing that is a very emotional thing. Does it hit you more to read that here in the valley? There's something about coming to this exact location and rereading it again. When I read this passage, I often think about my own life. And there are times in my life I wish I had the faith to stand up to things that trouble me and things that taunt me in life. It's obvious that David was able to face this person who was much bigger than him, but he knew where his faith was. And he knew, based on past experiences with God, that he was gonna be the victor here, as with anybody if God's on their side. I think everybody who reads the story of David and Goliath feels that way. That there are moments where we wish we had demonstrated the faith of David in overcoming obstacles and trusting in God, not just having faith in general, but trusting that God would deliver us and that he would respond. And in the development of the context of 1 Samuel and the United Kingdom, you've got this incredible transition happening between Saul and David. You have the king who's giving his garments, his armor, to somebody else. You've got David who ends up using a shepherd's sling as his weapon of choice, but it was Saul's tribe, the Benjamites, that were renowned for their accuracy with a sling. So David's using Saul's tribe's weapon to take down this giant. There should have been Saul down there, but he didn't do it. The writer of 1 Samuel is establishing David as Saul's replacement. He's the next anointed, he's the next king. And to be here, it's not just another story. It's not just another myth. It fits the geography of the land. And he puts so much attention and detail into that to help us establish that. Every culture lionizes its heroes. They glorify and exaggerate facts. It's easy to think, and I know that there are skeptics who do, they read the David and Goliath story and think, well, that's just so made up. But with what Barry pointed out, it's so rooted in accurate geography, even subtle details in this quest for, was this real? Did it actually happen? It fits the history of the period between the Philistines and the Israelites. The entire world is familiar with the David and Goliath story. From a literary perspective, it's powerful because in David's speech, he emphasizes, he already knows that people are going to hear about the next couple of minutes for the rest of history. And he wants them to understand something about God from it, not something about him. The reason that Goliath went down was because God helped David do that. And the God of Israel, the Yahweh of Israel, was the true and living God. Walking around here in the valley is a really neat way to experience it. But there's also other vantage points as well. I want to take you to a hillside where the Israelites were encamped. There's a site up there called Kerbet Kiapa. They've done some recent excavation work there from the time of David. And I think from there, we can get a much better visual image of the entire area. Although it's a little bit more difficult to get to. So beautiful.
one of the reasons why we wanted to come up here was to see this beautiful view of the Elah Valley. The Philistines, of course, would have been on that side, the Israelites on this side, and you can see how the whole battle would have happened right here in front of you. If you can imagine, for 40 days, Goliath coming out of those hills and standing right down there, they could have easily hurt him. David goes down and slays Goliath. The Philistines have officially lost, but then the Israelites rush down the side to follow David, and they chase the Philistines toward Gath. They do, and it says that they fell on the way to Sha'arim. The question is, is where is Sha'arim? We're not 100% sure, but the word Sha'arim in Hebrew means two gates. When they dug here at Kerbeth Kiapa, this city actually has two gates. And so it's probable that the place where the Philistines were killed were along this road between Kerbeth Kiapa and Gath. What other value is there to coming up here besides just the view? A lot of the things they found here are unique, and they're unique to the time of King David, and they're unique to the Judean cities. For instance, come on into this room right here. Let me show you something. All of these cities had casemate walls, and what you have here are a double set of walls that surround the entire part of the city, but you'll see this gap here in the middle. Well, this gap could be used as an extra room or a storage room. However, in the event that they were attacked, mm -hmm. they could fill this with even personal items, but debris and everything, and that would give a huge thick wall to protect them. So what you're saying is, is this type of wall built during David's reign, there are so many things they found here that are dated to that period in the Iron Age, that this is evidence that David was a ruler of more than just a tribal area, that he was a monarch. It wasn't just that he was ruling from Jerusalem. There are cities, walled cities, fortified cities, outside of where he was living. That's exactly like what we read in the Bible. To stand on top of this city and overlooking one of his greatest moments of victory, there was a wheat field and there was a vineyard, there was an olive grove. To see the sun moving across that, it just felt so, so grand. That was pretty special. When you read about David being pursued by Saul, and he moves from place to place to place, the, the forest of Hereth, or over to Moab to ask the king there to keep his parents safe. He's a fugitive, trying to stay one step ahead of him. But this is a decade-long pursuit. There's a lot that happens in between David killing Goliath and him hiding out in a cave. Saul sent soldiers after him a couple different times. He fled to the priests at Nob. He hid out in Gath, Goliath's hometown. And eventually he goes to the cave of Adullam. If he were to go from Gath to the cave of Adullam, which is what he did, he would have had to walk through the Valley of Elah. I wonder what went through his mind. I mean, just prior to this, that was the location where he had been praised because of what he did. And now he's on the run. The Caves of Dullam sit in a fairly remote part of the country. I think that's probably one of the reasons why he came out here. He knew that he would be at least temporarily secluded from King Saul and his men as that were chasing him. Wow, this is incredible. It is so much larger in here than I expected. There are caves heading off in that direction. There's caves heading off in this direction. I can see light down here, so there must be another opening down there somewhere. This is the perfect place for David to hide. He's up high. He could easily go outside this cave. He could see for miles around him. A natural fortified location. How deep does this cave system go? You know, I have no idea. You want to go find out?